Good afternoon, and welcome to the 2022 National Institute of Mental Health Women's Mental Health webinar entitled Improving Treatments for Mood Disorders and Depressive Symptoms in Women During Mid and Later Life. My name is Tamara Lewis Johnson, and I am the Chief of the Women's Mental Health Research Program at the NIMH Office of Disparities Research and Workforce Diversity. The purpose of the webinar series is to spotlight research on mental health disparities, women's mental health, minority mental health, and rural mental health. This afternoon, we are spotlighting the research of Drs. Barbara Perry and Susan Girdler. Dr. Vanetta Dotson is unable to participate in the webinar. This research was funded by the NIMH's Division of Translational Research. Please allow me to introduce our moderator for today's webinar. Dr. Laura Rowland serves as the Chief of the Neuroscience of Mental Disorders and Aging Program in the Geriatrics and Aging Processes Research Branch in the Division of Translational Research. Her program supports translational neuroscience studies of risk, presentation, course, and outcome of mental illness in later life or in the relation to the aging process. So today's webinar is focused on the menopausal transition, which is a period of vulnerability for the development and worsening of mood disorders. So our presenters today are going to highlight current research findings on the underlying biobehavioral mechanisms that may increase depression and other mood disorders during the menopause transition. So our first speaker is Dr. Barbara Perry, and she will give the talk titled Circadian Rhythms, Sleep and Light Interventions and Menopausal Depression. Dr. Perry is a research professor of psychiatry at the University of California, San Diego, UCSD, where she has served as director of the Women's Mood Disorders Clinic of the U.S. UCSD Outpatient Psychiatric Services and the La Jolla Psychiatry Specialty Clinics, Director of the Women's Mental Health Clinic at the San Diego Veterans Administration Healthcare Center. The second presenter is Dr. Susan Girdler, and her talk will, is titled Hormone Sensitivity and the Stressful Life Events, Predictors of Response to Transdermal Estradiol and Perimenopausal Women. Dr. Girdler is professor and vice chair of faculty development in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I now hand it over to Dr. Perry. All right, you can see that, all right. I'll be speaking yes. on circadian rhythm, sleep and light interventions in menopausal depression. Um, so the hypothesis is that the disturbances in the phase or timing, the amplitude or temporal organization of circadian rhythms characterize menopausal depression. And that can be corrected by critically timed sleep and light interventions, we call Sally, thereby improving mood and sleep. It's illustrated here, normally melatonin is a rhythm that goes up a couple hours before sleep time is maintained throughout the night and comes back in the early morning hours and it's in phase uh, with the sleep time. But uh, estrogen and progesterone when they change during menopause or other reproductive events can shift melatonin later with respect to sleep or earlier. Progesterone tends to delay rhythms and estrogen to advance them. Uh, and likewise, uh, sleep can get out of phase with melatonin. This can often happen in jet lag so that the sleep time is uh, later than the melatonin time and or it's earlier than the melatonin and it's not in sync as we would expect with a um, someone whose mood and sleep is in, uh, in sync. Uh, in the methods uh, in this study, we took perimenopausal women and uh, who were depressed by DSM-5 criteria, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders for major depression, and then normal control women without major medical or psychiatric illness. They were off psychoactive medication for two weeks and 
um, for hormone replacement therapy or the antidepressant fluoxetine for four weeks. We measured plasma melatonin, serum cortisol, prolactin, and TSH, but I'll be focusing on melatonin today. We sampled every 30 minutes between 6 p.m. and 11 a.m. overnight, and uh, patients were kept in the dim light conditions under 30 lux, and we measured serum estradiol, progesterone, follicle-stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone at 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. We also measured sleep by polysomnography and sleep logs by the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. For the statistical analysis, we looked at covariance of age, final menstrual period, body mass index, season when tested, and a morning eveningness questionnaire, which we applied to the data. Um, when we look at the demographics uh, of these uh, women, uh, the only really significant difference uh, was that in the depressed patients, they had a higher history of personal and family history of psychiatric illness. And uh, also with regard to their Hamilton and Beck, their depression rating scores, um, they are certainly higher in the depressed patients. And the normal controls were more uh, morning types on the Horn-Osberg morning and evening scale than were the depressed patients. And when we examined uh, the plasma melatonin every 30 minutes, uh, here's the normal control uh, profile of melatonin. Uh, and we found that the depressed patients actually had higher levels. And this was particularly in the early morning hours between like two and 5 a.m. And we looked at those women who had a family history of depression. And that was even more marked in terms of them having a higher melatonin levels in the early morning hours which potentially can delay your sleep uh, end time and then prevent you from getting morning light to help synchronize rhythms. We measure melatonin and, uh, by the timing measures, the time of its onset, by its synthesis offset when the synthesis has stopped and by its return to baseline, the offset and the timing between onset and offset, the duration and then the amplitude measures its peak levels and the area under the curve. And then we define these um, melatonin parameters. We fit a slope to it. And when the log transformed melatonin concentration curve first becomes steeply positive for at least three consecutive points, we call that onset. The synthesis offset is when the slope curve, the slope of the curve becomes steeply negative for at least three consecutive time points. Um, the off baseline offset is when it returns back to zero. The duration is the difference between onset and offset. The peak is the highest concentration and the area under the curve is the integrated melatonin between onset and offset. So when we look at these variables with menopausal depression versus normal controls, uh, we find that the peak levels are higher in the depressed patients the area, the curve is higher in the depressed patients. When we look at the, those who have a family history of uh, depression, uh, we find that the timing measures are significantly different. Um, the depressed uh, patients with a positive family history have a later melatonin offset time and a longer duration. A melatonin duration in uh, non-human animal species is the critical melatonin parameter that regulates changes in behavior, like with the seasons and hibernating and so forth. We also measure urinary measures of, uh, of melatonin and we collect overnight samples because that's when the melatonin is secreted. Two overnights for 36 hours, starting at 6 p.m. and going till 12 p.m. the following day. And we look at the onset time, which we uh, defined by the upward crossing of the cosine meser after we have fit a cosine curve to it. The offset is the downward crossing and the acrophase is the time of the peak uh, melatonin of 6-SMT, 6 6-alphatoxy 6 melatonin uh, quantity of the cosine fitted curve. And so we look at the amplitude uh, measures here, the mesor, the mean, and the acrophase is the timing of the highest point. 
And when we examine this in uh, menopausal depressed women's versus normal controls, the acrophase or the timing measure is later in the depressed patients versus the normal controls. Um, the only difference we find between the uh, reproductive hormones is that in the depressed patients, the follicle stimulating hormone is higher, which has been found by uh, other uh, groups as well compared to the normal controls and that may reflect their time since menopause. Now we also look at the sleep variables and these are the results from um, the polysomnography and actually depressed um, menopausal women uh, sleep uh, as well as normal controls. There aren't significant differences in sleep latency, which is the time to sleep onset, sleep efficiency, the rapid eye movement, uh, latency or REM sleep when most dreaming occurs or the total sleep time. If we look at those um, women who have a family history of depression, then we find that the uh, actually the, the sleep of the menopausal depressed patients, uh, they, their sleep efficiency is actually higher and their, their lighter stages of sleep are, are slightly lower. However, if we look um, at the subjective ratings of sleep, and there is often a mismatch between objective measures of sleep and subjective measures of sleep. And in this case, even though the menopausal depressed patients by polysomnography or objective measures of sleep are sleeping as well as the normal controls uh, uh, subjects, the uh, depressed patients report more awakenings um, compared to the normal controls. And when we look at the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, the depressed menopausal women report poor sleep compared to the normal controls. Again, even though their objective sleep is um, just is, is pretty very similar. We also try to measure uh, hot flashes by skin conductance. Uh, it was it's pretty hard to get women to to participate in this, but um, I think the bottom line is that um, there were not a more hot flashes by skin conductance measures in the depressed patients uh, compared to the normal controls that would you could account for um, more subjective sleep disturbances, either in terms of frequency, duration, or severity. Um, however, they again, um, in terms of subjective assessment of the, the, the hot flashes, um, it's not a significant difference, but there's a trend for the depressed patients to report a higher frequency and severity of hot flashes. So based on this component of the study, we found that the plasma melatonin secretion was increased in the early morning hours between 2.30 and 5.30 in the menopausal depressed patients versus the normal controls. In those who had um, a family history of major depression, there was more of a delayed offset time of melatonin secretion. Urinary melatonin measures also supported the plasma measure, uh, measures in that secretion had a delayed offset in the acrophase. Uh, I didn't think I had time to show these data, but cortisol, prolactin, and TSH were not significantly different between depressed patients and normal controls. So the follicle stimulating hormone levels were higher in the menopausal depressed patients. Although the polysomnography was not different, those women who had a family history of depression tended to have uh, deeper sleep and less lighter sleep, but they rated their subjective sleep by logs as having poor sleep quality. So uh, now that was the basis for our looking at the sleep and light uh, interventions. We can shift circadian rhythms um, by shifting sleep and by uh, shifting uh, rhythms with light. Um, to give a little background and rationale for this, um, one of the great paradoxes in life is that if you take a depressed patient and you keep them up all night, a majority of them will uh, improve their mood and have antidepressant effects of that intervention um, by the next day. This was the history of this is that nurses in Europe and at the NIH observed in patients who had manic depressive illness or bipolar illness that they did not sleep the night before switching from a depression into mania. And subsequently, studies showed that just one night of staying up all night induced rapid antidepressant effects in one day. 
and also found that only a partial night of sleep restriction four hours was required to induce this antidepressant effect in benefit mood. Um, there's now been uh, over 30 studies and over a thousand patients that show that a majority of depressed patients respond to one night of what we call wake therapy uh, or therapeutic sleep uh, restriction or deprivation. Some, but not all patients may relapse with when they go back to sleep the following night and even with a nap the following day. There's a different response in hormonal profiles between those who respond after the first night and uh, those who respond after they've gone back to sleep, what we call recovery night of sleep. Um, one seems to be a noradrenergic mechanism and the second night responders, which we have found characterizes many women with reproductive depressions, they have more serotonin deficiency and it enhances serotonin function. Um, and whether it's being awake in the first half or the second half of the night seems to depend on someone's underlying circadian phase. So how does this work? We think that uh, sleep and circadian rhythms that are realigned, they've been out of phase with each other. Uh, it also could work by uh, rapid eye movement sleep or dream sleep occurs in the second half of the night and is often uh, depressogenic and most antidepressants suppress REM sleep. Um, and so this being awake, when patients are sleeping at the wrong phase of the circadian cycle, the suppression of REM sleep may be therapeutic. Uh, it also may be what we call an increase in homeostatic drive. The longer you've been awake, um, the more you're gonna sleep better the following night. And as uh, people age, um, this homeostatic drive tends to decrease. So if you're up, for a longer period of time, you're gonna sleep better the next night, which can also improve your mood. And there's documented evidence of a change as thyroid function. Uh, many people, like, for those who've been on call, for example, if you've been up all night, you feel a buzz the next day, that's probably your thyroid uh, hormones kicking in. Now, how do you maintain this effect if um, you lose it so rapidly? One way is to give light treatment, which we have uh, chosen to do. And, but it needs to be bright light, like 10,000 lux, 30 minutes a day, at least five times the intensity of normal room light. And uh, morning light, bright light will advance uh, circadian rhythms, whereas evening light will delay them. You can also phase shift the sleep-wake cycle and advance at 30 minutes, like 5 p.m. a day, but that's not very practical for um, uh, many people. You can also, at, uh, enhance the effect with lithium or antidepressants, but uh, particularly in pregnant or postpartum women, that's not a, really always a, the best option. And it may also be true for menopausal women who may need estrogen to enhance their effects of antidepressants. So we've wanted to um, explore uh, combining the wake therapy and the light therapy. And the rationale is that the wake therapy will hasten and potentiate the effects of light therapy, uh, which otherwise may take at least um, six weeks to exert its efficacy. And in older people, uh, uh, like eight weeks, um, if just using light treatment alone in a non-seasonal uh, depression. Um, on the other hand, light therapy can prevent the relapse after the wake therapy occurs. And so we can use both this wake and sleep uh, adjustment to advance or delay, shift it earlier or later, wake, these wake and light interventions and help realign disturbed sleep and melatonin circadian rhythms. And there's a more potent effect of combined therapy. Our conceptual model is that um, in menopausal depression, as it, we've shown from the um, preliminary uh, baseline data that the uh, melatonin uh, profiles are delayed in um, depressed patients uh, compared to the normal controls. And then if we intervene with a phase of what we call a phase advanced probe or intervention, where we advance sleep and use morning light to advance rhythms, we hypothesize that those rhythms will become realigned. In contrast with a phase delay uh, probe or phase delay intervention, we anticipate that uh, there won't be that much difference and the rhythm may actually be a little bit more delayed. 
And so what we did in this study is we took perimenopausal women by their, uh, determined by their final menstrual period um, using DSM-5 five criteria for depression and normal control women. And they were randomized in a parallel trial to the active phase advanced intervention or probe, which we use late night wake therapy. That means they're awake in the uh, latter part of the night and they sleep in the early part of the night from 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. And they just do that one night. And then we add morning bright light, which uh, phase advances or shifts circadian rhythms of melatonin earlier. We started with 60 minutes daily, uh, starting within a half an hour of their habitual wake time. And we started using uh, initially eight weeks of treatment. And um, we compared that to the control phase delay intervention or probe where we used early night wake therapy where uh, participants were awake during the early part of the night and they slept in the late part of the night for four hours. So we shifted and uh, restricted sleep from 3 to 7 a.m. just for one night. And then we gave the evening bright white light, which shifts rhythms earlier for 60 minutes daily, starting 90 minutes before their habitual uh, bedtime and did that for eight weeks. So this is just a schematic illustration after baseline screening uh, and diagnostic evaluation and collecting urine for melatonin and actigraphy. Uh, they either got the phase advanced intervention where they slept from 9 to 1 a.m. one night and then they were given morning light uh, for two weeks. We initially started with eight weeks, but then we subsequently found that the two weeks was as effective as the eight weeks. So then we reverted to the two weeks to reduce the burden on uh, the patients. Um, and that was compared to the phase delay intervention, which they sleep from 3 to a.m. to 7 a.m. One, one night, and they get evening light to delay their rhythms um, for 30 minutes a day within 60 minutes of the onset of sleep. And for this particular study, we used the light book just because it was more uh, portable. We had started initially with very much larger uh, light boxes, but those, those proved to be rather cumbersome. Um, we now have moved on to using a sort of an intermediate size light box just because uh, we want to be sure that the light box covers the full visual field. But it is a bright light and uh, it's in the blue green uh, spectrum. And we found that uh, just at baseline, first, the, the higher the depression score, the more depressed the subjects were, uh, the worse their sleep was. So mood and sleep at baseline were correlated. Uh, and then consistent with our hypothesis that with the phase advanced, uh, uh, let me just get, before I, I get to the, the treatment effects, that we found that before, before the interventions, um, the acrophase in the depressed patients was uh, basically uh, shifted later compared, uh, uh, the, the acrophase was shifted um, somewhat, I should say, uh, different in the pre probe condition, uh, the depressed patients uh, compared to the normal controls. And uh, with the treatment, However, in the, uh, the phase advanced intervention, we found that the offset time, which is a critical parameter in melatonin synthesis, uh, particularly in humans, onset and offset move differently in response to light. The offset time was significantly advanced um, from before the intervention till after the in intervention. Whereas in the um, control condition, uh, there was really no significant uh, movement in the offset time. And we found that the more the mood improved, the more there was a phase advance. The advanced phase advances uh, illustrated by positive numbers here. So the greater mood improvement correlated with the greater phase advance of the melatonin rhythm. And just to show that um, the early wake therapy and the um, evening light did not uh, worsen mood. Uh, I show this slide, um, but it can also have beneficial effects. And we think that may be because of its effects on sleep, that the early wake therapy and the evening light 
significantly improve sleep, uh, their sleep quality, uh, both compared to normal controls and to, to their baseline measures. Whereas the um, phase advance intervention uh, did not have significant effects on sleep. And we find that in other groups as well. So, uh, but both treatments work within one or two weeks um, by the late wake therapy, shifting circadian rhythms and the early wake therapy, uh, improving sleep combined with their respective light treatments. And so menopausal depressed patients versus, versus normal controls have phase delayed urinary melatonin rhythms in conclusion. And the sleep and light probes that advance melatonin rhythms improve mood more than the control uh, probes that delay their rhythms. The two weeks is, has equal efficacy to eight weeks of intervention that sleep improves more with the phase delay a probe or intervention in the depressed versus the normal controls. Um, and so we target both melatonin rhythms and the sleep to improve mood. So the advantages of uh, sleep and light therapy is that it's a non-pharmacologic treatment. It's well tolerated. It has few side effects. It is rapid acting. It can be done at home. It can be done independent of hospital and clinic visits, certainly an advantage during the pandemic. It is affordable and repeatable, and it can be administered by uh, paraprofessionals. So we've also explored this in other uh, reproductive related mood disorders, such as premenstrual postpartum uh, uh, depression. And those women who have phase delayed melatonin and sleep rhythms, we advance and restrict uh, sleep and then give morning bright light. And those women who have faced advanced melatonin sleep rhythm, for example, during pregnancy, we delay and restrict, restrict sleep and give evening light. And we find the efficacy within one or two weeks in all conditions. So our body is like a clock. If one wheel be amiss, all the rest are disordered. The whole fabric suffers with such admirable art and harmony as a man composed, as Robert Burton said in The Anatomy of Melancholy. And as Francis Crick said, if a breakthrough in the study of the brain does come, it is perhaps likely to be at the level of the overall control of the system. If the system were as chaotic as it sometimes appears to be, it would, be, it would not enable us to perform even the simplest tasks satisfactorily to invent a possible, although unlikely example, the discovery that the brain processing was run phasically by some kind of periodic clock as a major computer is, would probably constitute a major breakthrough. So if we're ever gonna take over the world, we gotta synchronize our biological clocks. I couldn't do this work without my dedicated lab. As Helen Keller said, alone we do so little, but together we can do so much. And I'm indebted to my collaborators uh, as listed in the slide. Well, thank you. And I will turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Dr. Girdler. Thank you so much. Um, a little daunting to follow an icon like Dr. Perry, but I'm honored to be able to do so. And I uh, really appreciate being here today. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest to report, but I do want to express my gratitude to the National Institute of Mental Health that has provided support to a lot of the research that I've done in my career, including some of the research that I'll present today. Okay. There we go. So a couple objectives I want to touch very briefly just on some evidence that um, mood susceptibility to hormonal fluctuations really represents an abnormal response to normal hormone change. That transdermal estradiol, which is estradiol delivered through a skin patch, mm -hmm. um, we know that it's been shown to treat perimenopausal depression but I'll present some evidence today that it might actually prevent the emergence of depression during the menopause transition. But that recent stressful life events and hormone sensitivity to that uh, fluctuations will actually potentially predict the benefit of transdermal estradiol to, for affective symptoms in the menopause transition. And lastly, I'd like to suggest that this hormone susceptibility to hormonal flux may represent a transdiagnostic mechanism of risk for dysphoric mood and dysphoric mood state changes, which are common across almost all psychopathologies. 
So we know that reproductive events are a time of increased risk for mood disorders in females. So as hormones begin to rise with puberty and begin to cycle, we see there's an increased risk for first episode depression, the development of premenstrual dysphoric disorder, or menstrual magnification of a chronic affective illness. But risk is increased even greater during times of uh, tremendous hormonal change, such as occur, uh, occurs when there's a precipitous drop in high pregnancy levels into the postpartum period as well as um, during the menopause transition, when we know there's also very rapidly fluctuating uh, changes in reproductive hormones, but against a backdrop of estrogen withdrawal. And it would not be surprising that these fluctuations in ovarian hormones might influence mood because we know that these ovarian steroid hormones regulate virtually every neurobiological system that's ever been implicated in mood disorders. But not all women are sensitive or susceptible to mood impairment associated with these reproductive events. In fact, uh, far fewer than 50% of women are uh, sensitive to menstrual cycle fluctuations or postpartum hormone withdrawal or perimenopausal depression. So who are those women? Can we predict those women who are susceptible to hormonal flux and does that have implications for treatment? We know that women in the menopause transition are at elevated risk for depression. In fact, even those who've never had a depression prior to the transition have a twofold increased risk of developing depression during the menopause transition. And those with a prior history have up to a fourfold increase in risk. The endocrine experience of the menopause transition is summarized in this slide, whereas women approach their final menstrual period indicated by time zero here, you see a, a gradual decrease in estradiol or estrogen levels, that's the primary estrogen, estradiol, and a gradual increase in follicle stimulating hormones so that by about two years from a woman's final menstrual period, her estrogen levels are nice and low and stable, her FSH levels nice and high and stable. But these average data, very, very unlikely that they characterize the experience of any particular woman during the menopause transition. In fact, we know from these data of O'Connor and colleagues, which summarize uh, daily changes in progesterone on this upper graph, estrogen in the middle graph, and follicle stimulating hormone in the lower graph. These are daily changes in these hormones in a single woman in the menopause transition. The dark shaded hatches on the x-axis here represent menses, menstruation. And indeed the hallmark of the menopause transition is irregular menstrual cycle length. And bleeding patterns are the primary criterion for diagnosing a woman in the menopause transition. Not her hormone levels, not her menopausal symptoms, and not her age, but bleeding patterns. And we know that particularly when follicle stimulated hormone levels are variable, that can cause periods, um, which is occurs, for example, during times of uh, longer cycles and ovulatory cycles or skip cycles, that variability can produce both episodes of hypoestrogenism and hyperestrogenism. So in fact, estradiol levels can be higher on any day in the menopause transition than they ever are during a normal menstrual cycle. And what is the evidence that that kind of variability might be relevant to mood, this kind of experience? And I, I should say it's, it's not to be taken lightly either because exposure to that kind of endocrine environment can last on average five years. It's, on average, it's five years that women are in the menopause transition and other women can suffer from menopausal symptoms for many years beyond that. But the evidence of that variability might be relevant to depression uh, came from early research by Ellen Freeman and her colleagues. They followed women in the menopause transition, none of whom had had a prior depression. And they looked at their estradiol levels at an annual basis over eight years and found that while a woman's average estradiol level over eight years did not predict the development of depression, the variability 
the change in estradiol around that woman's average level over eight years did increase the odds of her developing uh, clinically significant depression as the variability in follicle stimulating hormone. Subsequent experimental research conducted actually by Peter Schmidt at the NIMH and his colleagues, they recruited women who were currently free of any depression, but some of these women had a past history of perimenopausal depression, others were unaffected controls. Schmidt and colleagues put all of these women on three weeks of transdermal estradiol. So you see these first three weeks here with the shaded uh, symbols. And all women showed nice low levels of depression. This is measured using the Center for uh, Epidemiological Scale Depression Score, a very common measure of depression in the field. Um, scores of 16 or above on this scale are, are indicative of major depression. So you can see during the three weeks of transdermal estradiol, everybody had very low stable um, depressive symptoms and he withdrew abruptly, took them quickly off of their transdermal patch to thirds of them. And those women who had that history of uh, prior perimenopausal depression showed an immediate increase, a rapid increase in their depressive symptom symptomatology with the withdrawal of these hormones, suggesting a, a hormone sensitive phenotype in perimenal dep depression, per I'm sorry, perimenopausal depression. Well, unaffected controls here in the open squares had the same abrupt withdrawal from estradiol, but it did not increase the depressive symptoms. So some evidence of an abnormal response to hormonal change in those who are vulnerable to perimenopausal mood disorders. And I do wanna also note that the women in the triangle here, um, they also had a past history of, of perimenopausal depression. Uh, they were left on the estradiol for the full six weeks and their depression symptoms remained low and stable. So these data among other data led my colleague, David Rubino and I to ask whether or not um, we know that it's effective for treating current depression in perimenopausal women, but could transdermal estradiol actually buffer against the emergence of depressive symptoms? And so in this study that we led, we recruited medically healthy, non-depressed women. We were very specific at making sure we recruited women who had very, very low depressive symptomatology and an average of five on that CESD score. They were 45 to 60 years of age, and they all met uh, standard criteria for being either in the early menopause transition, in other words, variable menstrual cycle lengths, the late menopause transition, they were starting to have skip periods, or within the first year of their postmenopausal time. We randomized 172 women to uh, 12 months of um, transdermal estradiol at 100 micrograms per day and gave uh, intermittent oral micronized progesterone every two to three months just to prevent endometrial uh, thickening or hyperplasia. Uh, or women were randomized to 12 months of transdermal placebo and oral placebo. And you can see 63 and 69 completed the study. We were very interested also in characterizing the psychosocial stress profile of our participants because we know the menopause transition is a time not just of hormonal change, but a tremendous change in psychosocial stress experiences. These were women who were recruited from the General Chapel Hill, North Carolina community. 60% of them had had at least one significant life event in the six months prior to enrollment, and over 30% of them had had two or more significant stressful life events, and you can see the nature of these stressors here on the slide. We were also interested, as Freeman and others had done, in looking at this issue of variability in estradiol and do, does it predict depression? And so we did that. We took advantage of the placebo arm of this study. So we um, had assessed estradiol from plasma, from serum specifically, from blood, over four months during a 14-month period. And those women who had been randomized to placebo over this 14 month period, and remembering each of them had very low depressive symptom levels on this scale and enrollment, we found that by month 14, those who had the higher estradiol variability over that 14 month period had higher depressive scores, but especially if they had been exposed to multiple recent stressful life events. <clears throat> 
So the combination of estradiol variability with stressful life events was the strongest predictor of who developed an increase in depressive symptomatology over that period. These are the data on the, the randomization effects that we found. So um, those women randomized to the active estradiol for 12 months are in pink and the placebo in the um, yellow, orangey color. Um, and we found that over 12 months of uh, assessment of, of daily mood and interaction between um, treatment with stressful life events. So on average, those women at the end of 12 months who'd been given the active estrogen did have lower depressive symptomatology, but that was especially true if women who had been exposed to two or more stressful life events prior to enrollment. So the benefit of estradiol on depressive symptomatology was significantly greater in women with recent stressful life events. Moreover, we found when we looked at episodes of clinical depression during that 12 month period, and on this scale, uh, we know that a score of 16 or greater uh, is predictive of major depression. Again, these women were all enrolled to be very low in depressive symptoms uh, at the beginning, but by 12 months, those who had been randomized to placebo, over 30% of them developed one or more clinically significant depressive episode and that risk was cut by two and a half times in those who were randomized to estradiol. And that risk was, um, that benefit, that risk benefit was especially evident in women in the early perimenopause transition compared with those in the late or the early postmenopause transition. So their risk in those in the early perimenopause transition showed especially beneficial risk for cutting the risk of those um, depressive episodes. And the um, reason behind that, really, we don't know. Um, it's not simply a matter that transdermal estradiol raises estrogen levels, though, because early perimenopausal women naturally have higher mean estrogen levels than do late or early postmenopausal women. So the explanation for this effect remains unexplained at present. So that was the first study um, to show that it may be that you can prevent the depression uh, in perimenopausal women with transdermal estradiol. But what are the mechanisms that might underlie the beneficial effects for affective symptoms? And so our um, recently completed study uh, was designed to look at that. And we went a little bit beyond a sort of a gross measure of just looking at estrogen variability but in this study, we, um, following the methods of Elizabeth Anderson and Jennifer Gordon, we created an individual difference score for um, estradiol mood sensitivity strength. So this is how it worked. Over the eight weeks of baseline in this study, we took weekly measures of serum estradiol. We also did weekly measures of, this time instead of looking at gross a measure of depression, we were interested in specific symptoms of anxiety and anhedonia because they're both core features of depression, but also transdiagnostic across most psychopathologies. And basically, we look at the correlation within each woman of the magnitude of change from week one to week two in her estrogen and how that correlates with her anxiety and anhedonia symptoms at that index week. So the correlation between this change and symptoms at this week, the correlation between this change and symptoms at this week, and so on and so forth over the eight-week baseline period, yielding an individual um, index of hormone sensitivity strength. In this study, it's a smaller study, as you can see, only 82 women were randomized. We had intended on a larger sample size, but the pandemic um, you know, ceased a lot of clinical research for quite a while. And um, with NIH approval, we terminated the study at this point because we had demonstrated we did have the power at least to look at main effects, the statistical power to look at our main effects and to look at our primary hypotheses. And so in this study, 42 were randomized, 42 women randomized to eight weeks of transdermal estradiol um, and 40 randomized to eight weeks of transdermal placebo. And again, these are women in the menopause transition, medically healthy 
Um, unlike our prior study, though, we did allow women who had um, elevated mood symptoms, though none were taking any psychotropic medications. And you can see the number of completers for this smaller randomized control trial. Our protocol was um, basically after enrollment, every woman went through a true social stress test. This one, we did not look at the biological responses. It was meant to control for the novelty effect of um, first exposure of this type of test. Here's our baseline period I've already mentioned. So eight weeks of um, estradiol assessment as well as anxiety with a Spielberger state trait anxiety inventory and anhedonia with a Smith Hamilton uh, anhedonia scale. Then they came in at the end of the eighth week for a stress testing protocol where we looked at cortisol and inflammatory, um, pro-inflammatory cytokine at IL-6 response to stress. Then women were randomized for another eight weeks to either active treatment with estradiol or placebo and had another um, stress test at the end of that period, as well as weekly mood assessments to look at intervention effects. By the way, um, I'll put that in there for myself, otherwise I knew I would forget. We did give the green climacteric scale uh, at enrollment at week eight and week 16, which allowed us to look at changes in vasomotor symptoms over time, because we know estrogen will uh, drastically reduce those symptoms and to control for that in terms of looking at our treatment effects on mood. So we really replicated, we were, uh, always love seeing replication, right? With the cornerstone of science, very similar findings to our previous study. Although instead of just a gross measure of depression, this is showing the anhedonia symptom score. Again, in this study, uh, during the baseline eight-week phase, we found that those women had, who had high estrogen variability and had been exposed to more recent stressful life events showed a higher uh, anhedonia symptom score. Anhedonia, by the way, is a kind of loss of pleasure and enjoyment that's very characteristic of depression that we don't see in uh, women with low variability. The same effects were seen in terms of uh, high E2 variability uh, predicting anxiety as well, but only at a statistical trend level. But we did find for the first time, uh, first study that we're aware of that has looked at the degree to which this estrogen variability modifies the stress response. This is in response to the TRIER social stress test. Women who had higher estrogen variability at baseline showed a much greater cortisol response to stress relative to women with lower variability, and they showed a blunted interleukin-6 response to stress relative, relative to women with lower variability. And this inverse relationship between cortisol and this pro-inflammatory cytokine has been documented previously, and because we know that cortisol regulates the immune response to stress, um, this provides a, a biologically plausible explanation for why we see this um, divergent direction of between cortisol stress response and IL-6. But the point, real point is that estrogen variability was modifying uh, a woman's stress response. Now to our treatment uh, effects, our intervention effects, we did find a uh, main effect of treatment. This is controlling for baseline symptom levels, as well as any change in vasomotor symptoms over time. We found that on average, women who were randomized to the active uh, transdermal estradiol intervention had lower anhedonia symptoms and lower anxiety symptoms at the post-randomization period relative to women who had been randomized to placebo. But this beneficial effect was really um, most evident in those women who at baseline had this higher anxiety, estrogen anxiety sensitivity strength score. So in other words, those women who at the baseline period over that eight weeks showed a really strong connection between their changes in hormones and their change in anxiety symptoms. Those women appear to show the greatest benefit of transdermal estradiol in terms of their post-randomization anxiety levels. So we couldn't um, explain this effect by either any kind of treatment effect on, on the stress reactivity or um, by uh, modulation by stressful life events. So we did explore in a, in a preliminary fashion 
um, with post hoc analyses, what else do we see in our data set that might explain this greater beneficial effect of transdermal estradiol in women who are sensitivity um, sensitive to estradiol fluctuations in terms of their anxiety? And we found an absolute parallel finding if we looked at somatic symptom um, based on the green climacteric scale, scale that has a subscale for somatic symptom bother. So how much are you bothered? How much impairment is there associated with your somatic symptoms? So these findings parallel what I just showed you for anxiety. And um, the subscale of the green score, um, the green scale that measures somatic symptoms includes uh, reports of dizziness, feeling faint, breathing difficulties, pressure or lightness in the head, numb and tingling in body parts. That comprises the somatic scale of the green. And those are exactly very, very similar symptoms that are associated with clinical anxiety. And so it's speculative, but we speculate that one mechanism by which transdermal estradiol may be particularly effective or beneficial in women with, uh, who are sensitive to hormonal flux and anxiety is um, by beneficially modulating the somatic symptoms of that anxiety. So to wrap things up, um, we and others have shown that estradiol variability predicts depression. And in our most recent study, preliminary results granted, we also show that it predicts anhedonia and anxiety symptoms, which are transdiagnostic. And that this relationship appears to be strengthened, and we've shown this in two studies now, by stressful life events. We also showed in this most recent study that the variability predicts a specific dysregulation in hypothalamic pituitary and IL-6 pro-inflammatory responses to stress. But whether that um, stress response dysregulation serves to mediate or serves to explain the relationship between estradiol variability and affective symptoms, we were unable to test in the study because of the early termination of the uh, research due to the pandemic. And so we did not have the statistical power to test for that mediation, which would be uh, an important next step. Oops, I did not mean to do that. I I can go back. Let's see if I can go back. Yes, I can. Um, we and others have shown that transdermal estradiol is effective in treating current depression and may be effective in prevent, preventing the emergence of depressive symptoms in perimenopausal women. And that both stressful life events and sensitivity to this hormonal flux may in fact be predictors of the beneficial response to transdermal estradiol in terms of affective syndrome. And so wouldn't it be cool if um, items from a clinical interview such as stressful life event exposure, sensitivity to hormonal flux over the course of a woman's reproductive life, um, and somatic symptoms could actually be predictive of beneficial response to interventions and therefore advance our precision medicine of treating perimenopausal mood disorders. Great, thank you very much. And it's been a pleasure to be with you all today. Thank you so much, Dr. Girdler and Dr. Perry. So now we're going to start the Q&A session. So we have lots of questions in the Q&A box. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with some methodological questions that came up. So first I'm gonna ask Dr. Perry a couple questions. So one is, with the bright light therapy, are there any adverse effects with the eyes? No, uh, there's some, uh, you know, some women may get some uh, eye strain. They feel like they've, it's too close to them. And so uh, we can be flexible and have them, uh, instead of being a foot and a half away from the light box, uh, move further away or do 20 minutes instead of 30 minutes um, but that hasn't really been a major problem. 
Okay, great. That's wonderful to hear. The other methodological question was, were your controls age matched to the depressed groups? And a second one was, did you use standard deviation or standard error bars in your graphs? Uh, we use standard error bars in the graphs and the um, depressed versus normal controls were selected on symptomatology and in relation to their FSH. We looked at whether there was a co as, was age as a covariate where there are not significant differences between the, the groups. Wonderful, thank you so much. Okay, turning to Dr. Girdler, there was a question about what instrument or measures you use to assess dys dysphoria or depression. I think you mentioned it briefly. Could you mention it once again for the audience? Absolutely. So the primary measure was the Center for Epidemiologic Scale Depression Subscale, the CESD, and it's very probably one of the most commonly used measures of depression in the perimenopausal um, research studies. Um, but then we also, in our most recent study, um, use other scales to measure specifically the symptoms of anhedonia and anxiety. So we use the SNAPE. Hamilton Anadonia scale, and we use the Spielberger state trait anxiety inventory. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Perry, there was a question regarding the improvement effects. So how you measured up to eight weeks, I believe. And so how long do you think these effects can be sustained? Well, we tried to do a follow-up study for um, like three months afterwards, um, but we didn't find, uh, we didn't have the funding to pay for that and many of the participants didn't continue. You know, they could off, we could offer them to come back and have the other treatment if it, it didn't work. Um, but, uh, you know, we're trying to do that now, but with limited resources. Um, but the, the advantage is you can always restart this. You don't mm -hmm. have to, um, we do that for other, um, the data, for example, in other mood disorders, uh, Anna Verts Justice has followed uh, mood disorder patients and find that the, these interventions uh, last for at least up to nine, nine months afterwards. Okay, that's great. And yeah, you did mention that this is something that could be repeated um, as well. So uh, look forward to additional research on this. Dr. Girdler, there has been been a few comments regarding hormone replacement therapy. And so, you know, many clinicians are apprehensive of prescribing hormone replacement therapy. So do you think that your results of your study will help um, improve, you know, the prescription of hormone replacement therapy and perhaps discuss other barriers? Sure, sure. And I know Dr. Perry could very much contribute to this discussion as well too. So I invite her to, to make comments after I make a few. So, um, you know, we certainly know that subsequent to the original release of the um, findings from the Women's Health Initiative that scared everybody to death, that if you gave women hormones, they were gonna develop breast cancer and they were gonna have heart attacks and strokes and all of that. We know there's a lot to unpack from that study and what we did learn from that is that um, giving older women who have been many years from their last menstrual period or women who a lot of the women in that study were also either overweight or obese, had established hypertension, had had a history of hormone exposure, which we know can increase our risk for breast cancer, um, that in that sample, certainly we learned a lot about maybe the type of women who would not be good candidates for hormones. But there's so much with secondary analyses of those same data, we know that this, there's this timing hypothesis that women who start hormones early in the menopause transition, and those were the women who were always intended for hormones. In fact, there's decades of observational evidence that show that women who prescribed hormones in the menopause transition by their clinicians, they showed a 50% reduction in risk of coronary heart disease and all cause mortality. And in fact, that subgroup of the Women's Health Initiative, if you look at the early, the younger women in their 50s, they also showed cardio protection, they showed a reduction in cardiac events with the active estrogen. But it's a complicated question because uh, it's 
depends on timing, where a woman is with respect to her last menstrual period. So the effects of estrogen are beneficial if started early or detrimental potentially if started later. The route and the dose of the hormones, very important. So transdermal estradiol, the skin patch, for example, which uh, we use in our studies, uh, we know that that's the recommended route for particularly women who are at high metabolic risk. And it's also uh, associated with much lower risk of uh, uh, embolisms or blood clots. So the route is important, the dose is important, the age of the woman's important, her medical health is important, her family history is important. So um, all of these decisions should be made uh, you know, personally with your healthcare provider. Um, but I want to also point out that the benefit, so there are risks, there's no hormone that's completely safe, but we want, also want to consider what are the benefits. We know that there's tremendous benefit for fracture, hip fracture, other bone fracture associated with using hormones. It's effective for sleep. So Dr. Perry, I know that's relevant to all your work. Um, it helps sleep, it, it improves sexual functioning as women age. And so it's really a matter of a risk benefit analysis to determine uh, for which women, and that's what some of our research is trying to look at, you know, which women will show the, the greatest benefit of using hormones. Um, but it is, it's a, you know, it's definitely complicated, a lot of factors to consider. But um, as David and I wrote a paper, I think, and I give him credit for titling David Rubino and I, you know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because there's a lot of benefit if it is done in an informed fashion in terms of using uh, hormones. Barbara, would you like to add anything to that? Very comprehensive answer. I've just underscored the timing, the, er the early menopause versus, you know, 10 years after and the other cohort medical conditions. Uh, also, you know, absolute versus relative risk, the absolute risk in like, you know, four in 10,000 women, I think that has to be taken into consideration. And um, also if it's the estrogen versus the progesterone to that in the women who had uh, hysterectomies and could be given estrogen alone. Uh, we didn't see the same risk factors. And that, I was just, that uh, spurs the question, if I may return, uh, I, you had to give the progesterone to, to prevent the um, endometrial hyperplasia. Did you notice any significant effects on mood during those, the time period, the short time period you had to give the progesterone? No, that's a good question. No, we did not. We used oral micronized um, prometrium which is a bioidentical and is a different progesterone than what was used in the Women's Health in Initiatives. Um, and we only gave it for 10 days, you know, every two to three months. So we did not notice, and we weren't, I have to be perfectly honest, we weren't really focused on that. Sure. Um, but, you know, there was nothing evident in terms of uh, an effective mood. And we were careful to do most of our measures kind of um, dis disentangled from the timing of the progesterone. That's what I figured. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much for answering the, that question. Um, there was another question that came in that, that's along these lines. And the person asked, when is a good time to pr um, prescribe hormone, hormone replacement thera therapy to prevent depression? So is it during the time when FSH and estrogen estradiol start to fluctuate um, or when the menstrual cycle starts fluctuating or both? Do you have any insight? Uh, Barbara, you're the clinician. Would you like to <laughs> take that one? Well, uh, I think earlier, the bet, you know, um, is better. <laughs> um, and, and some uh, gynecologists often may put women on uh, like oral contraceptives uh, during the transition, um, though they're the higher dose. Um, but I think, uh, as you pointed, uh, Dr. Gerber pointed out early on, I think early in the menopausal uh, transition is better. Um, that this seems to be protective uh, for at least the next 10 years. And then uh, paying attention to the other uh, effects 
of health, you know, exercise and, and sleep. And, right. um, uh, but there is uh, supportive evidence that the, um, you know, the antidepressants work better with uh, when estrogen is given with them, that the antidepressants alone in um, perimenopausal women and early postmenopausal women aren't as effective. They don't have the same downregulation effect on the serotonin receptors postsynaptically. Um, and uh, so that can be an additional treatment. If I can just also, mm -hmm. the other uh, additive treatment that seems to be very helpful um, is thyroid replacement, low dose, very low dose uh, thyroid replacement, which can enhance the effect of antidepressants and estrogen and thyroid uh, work synergistically. Interesting. Well, thank you so much. And so again, it's just not one particular sign. It's not measuring a hormone level. It's really early in the perimenopausal transition period. Thank you. Do you have any questions for each other before we close this session? No? Okay. I will end by asking one question from our audience member. What's the take-home message for the clinicians listening to these talks? Do you have any, any last remarks? Well, uh, I'll step forward if I can. I, I just think that, uh, you know, the sleep and light interventions have, I think, been overlooked. Um, they're very widely used in Europe. And um, I think that uh, for the often... Uh, circadian rhythm disruption that occurs, uh, whether it's during the menstrual cycle, pregnancy, postpartum, or menopause. I think these are rapid acting treatments that have are very well tolerated. A few side effects can be done at home, done by a, a paraprofessional. And I think it's certainly uh, worth a try and they don't have the side effects of medications or hormonal uh, treatments. Um, so I think they've been uh, overlooked and uh, it's certainly dependent on a circadian phase. So, you know, light in the middle of the day is not necessarily that effective uh, unless you have uh, patients with uh, bipolar illness who both light and sleep interventions can induce mania, then light in the middle of the day is important. But, you know, light at dawn and dusk and shifting rhythms with light and sleep, I think has an important potential therapeutic uh, uh, it should be part of our tools, I think. And we're trying to move it out into the community with that in mind. I totally agree. It should be part of our tools. I think <laughs> incredible work that you're doing, you've done, Dr. Perry, over your career. And I would might just add that, um, you know, I think a lot of Dr. Perry's work and, and what we're trying to do is really meant to ultimately inform clinicians about how they might think about prescription precision medicine or individualized approach to treating uh, women at midlife in terms of depression. So, you know, uh, interviewing, finding out what else is going on in their lives, what stress are they experiencing? And also I think it's um, worth the time to, if you really wanna know, is this perimenopausal depression? Is this really probably triggered by the the hormone fluctuations before you decide to prescribe transdermal estradiol, you know, doing a, a history in terms of when did symptoms onset? When did anxiety or depression symptoms onset? Were they correlated with changes in menstrual bleeding? Or had there always been sort of a history of depression and anxiety? And, and now because there's also greater stress such as empty nesting, and death of loved ones and divorce and all these horrible things that happen to us midlife women, um, you know, is that, are those events um, more of an explanation? So, you know, I just think it's a matter of just really some, um, you know, careful clinical interviewing to help inform a treatment approach for any individual woman. Thank you and so I, much. I, I'd just like to echo the, the fine work of Dr. Girdler in bringing the stress picture in and mm -hmm. how that interdigitates with um, past history of depression. And I think that's a major contribution to the field. <laughs> Thank you.
So I want to thank you both for, for these wonderful presentations, and we look forward to seeing what you produce in the future. And on that, the upcoming seminars in the series, we have four upcoming seminars in the near future. Please go to www.odwdwebinars.org to register for them. Next slide, please. And I want to thank everybody for attending. And for programmatic questions and information on webinar recordings, please contact us at nimhodwd at nih.gov. Thank you again.